podcasting from Chico, California, tucked in between some of Northern California's best freshwater fisheries. This is the Barbless Podcast, a podcast about NorCal fly fishing, guiding, fisheries management, and sustainability. If you have ideas or any questions for the show, leave the guys a voice message on the Barbless Podcast hotline, area code 530-636-2523. Also check out http colon slash slash podcast.barbless.co, where you can download past episodes and show notes. Be sure to follow them on Instagram at barbless.co and connect with them on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. Fish on. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Barbells Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Hanna. I'm here with uh, Chad Alderson. Chad, how are we doing, man? Good. Just got back from a steelhead trip. Yeah, and mm-hmm. you and you went on the Yuba, right? You fished the Yuba? Yeah, with H to the B to the G to the H. I don't know. What's it? What's Hogan's full uh, username? <laughs> I don't know. He needs H to, to the B to the Hogan Brown. <laughs> anyway, went with Hogan. Uh, we had a good time. My dad, it was my, we did Secret Santa and my dad, luckily he drew me or I drew him, however your perspective on that yeah, is. Yeah. And I, so I got him a, a guided trip and then I'm still, you know, I'm getting better at rowing a drift boat, but I'm by no means, um, you know, I don't think you guys would be smart to ride with me just yet <laughs> and have me row all day if you want to either die or not catch fish, but I'm getting better. And uh, Hogan gave me some good, good tips on the Yuba. And dad caught fish, so everybody was was happy. Nice, yeah, very good. I'm going up to uh, Gold Beach here tomorrow, and with the family, we're going to go kind of hang out in this beach house and maybe do some fishing on the coast. Blow right? out. Yeah, cool. Maybe do some crabbing. Um, I don't know. It was pretty we, tough. The fishing after for the coast, the, yeah, yeah even after a, the big rain. But we've got another storm coming. I in. I heard so. it's a tough year. Yeah. Well, well, for the reason we're here, we're here with uh, JD Ritchie. Uh, JD's the uh, vice president of NorCal Guides and Fish, uh, Sports and Association. <laughs> take me forever. It's a mouthful. To, take me forever to get that right. Um, and has been guiding shoot since the mid nineties, night August twenty eighth, nineteen ninety eight, to wow. be exact. Wow, nice. So yeah. you've seen some things. Yeah, unfortunately, most of them uh, bad. You know, as far as the the general trends go. But um, what what was the quote that we heard recently that even uh. Ernie's quote yeah. that we posted today yeah. about the asshole. Yeah. What, how's it go? <laughs> even um, even no. an asshole is, is tolerable when he's catching fish out there on the water. Yeah. 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 True. True that. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny. Well, thank it you for great. coming on the show, JD. Pre- yeah. Appreciate it. Well, it's, uh, we always ask this question. I, I know um, you've probably been guiding, uh, but when's the last time you went fishing yourself? Mm. When was the last time you would align? Mm, crickets. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, I, geez. Uh, not this year, I don't think. Really? Yeah. Um, not not because I don't, I mean, I still love it. I mean, I, yeah. I do it a lot. Um, yeah. Just when I'm not fishing, um, writing, doing stuff for the Guide Association. Oh, uh, yeah, being a dad and a husband, <laughs> you know, we're looking for a new house. And so, and plus steelhead fishing and it hasn't yeah. been that great. There's not a whole lot going on right now. So. Right. Actually, I take that back. Duh. I thought I saw some steelhead on plugs yeah. on your Facebook. Well, that's not me. That's me yeah. guiding. But right, okay. I, I did. I, geez, how quickly I forget. Just turned 50 and my brain's going. I actually went last night. Duh. Um, <laughs> I didn't touch the rod. I went with a buddy who was scouting for sturgeon. So we went out on the Sacramento River, and I just ate fajitas that uh, we picked up on the way and, and watched him bait his stuff. So I, I was out last night, but I didn't really fish. <laughs> so he's another guide, and he's looking for spots to potentially take clients? Yeah, the sturgeon have been kind of um, AWOL-ish lately. And yeah. usually when you get these big rains and they start pushing up the river, and mm-hmm. just hasn't been uh, – whacking on him too much yet so he's like hey you want to go out and it's like you know five o'clock till 10 at night so when he scouts for him is he using a fish finder or is he just hitting some holes with some bait seeing if he gets a pole and both then, okay. i mean he goes to the spots he knows and, okay. and then we were watching the graph and you know you hear him roll yeah. at night if they're there and, and hopefully you get some bites some positive yeah. feedback on the rods but what what's the regs these days because when i when i lived in princeton my stepdad at the time um he used to guide for mm-hmm. he used to guide sturgeon specifically mm-hmm. and dude he'd bring home like three or four in the back of his truck like four to six feet or eight feet long yeah. or however long these things are 
just every weekend. And it just, I'm like, this is not cool. You know, yeah, like they're... thinking about it <laughs> then was different than now, you right. know, like that can't be sustainable. So what's the, what's the deal with the limits these days? Is there a limit? Can you still take them? Yeah, you can. It's uh one a day, you get a sturgeon card and you get, uh, I don't know. I never keep them. So I don't know what the, what the number is, but there's a handful, like maybe it's five or 10, something like that. You can keep, I mean, I guess I could pull the card out, but for the uh, year, for the year, yeah. but, uh, they got to between be between 40 and 60 inches. Okay. So they're trying to keep the, the up and comings and the big mature mamas. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there's like a slot limit like there is for striper. Then, yeah. Basically. And, and you can't, of course, keep, you cannot keep green sturgeon. Right. Um, which, you know, they're on the threatened or endangered list. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. always been the case. Correct. Yeah, I mean, they're probably back in, you know, right. grandpa's day. You yeah. Could, but I yeah. don't remember ever being able to keep them, but I'm not sure when that switched. I, you know, I've always been more of a, a, uh, I guess they're an adramus too. I was going to say an adramus guy, but, uh, <laughs> a, something with chrome on it. Yeah. <laughs> they're one of the oldest anadromous fish yeah. probably that have been running our rivers for thousands of years. They're, they're actually pretty cool. I've, I've learned to, I mean, for a long time, the only ones I ever caught because I never fished for them, uh, we would catch them. You know, catch a few striper fishing um, on bait or jigs. Uh, we catch a few every year salmon fishing. They'll grab a quick fish or some bait. So I encounter them that way, but never really on purpose. And, yeah, and now that I've started doing that more, it's like they're 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 kooky old you know prehistoric critters, but they're actually kind of cool too. Mm-hmm. Right, little beady eyes on them, and <laughs> but they're they're I've been doing some reading on how they find their food and. There's two different uh, sensory perceptor things. They got the whiskers, right? They got the whiskers, and those. Yeah. It's interesting. They pick up stuff, um, sort of electronically, I guess, uh, mm, you yeah. know, to kind of dumb it down because that's yep. that's what I had to do. And then they they might find something that entices them uh, through that sensory process, and then they put it in their mouth, and they go, "Uh, uh-uh. uh." So the taste doesn't. You know, it's not always like the feelers don't don't convert into oh yeah this is good food so mm. i thought that was really interesting just so they sample a lot of stuff i guess so yeah mm. yeah so and they key off of an electromagnetic field probably yeah 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 they can sense like a clam bed they can sense living organisms <laughs> organisms under the under the mud so, so. cool yeah it's it, that's that's why i was kind of like these things are a little more than just a big sucker fish yeah know? uh nick took me up the 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 lower part of Yuba, the Yuba River below the dam, below is Daguerre, the mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. DPD. And do how many how many green sturgeon did we uh, jump that day? Yeah, it was nuts, a dozen at least. Yeah, we just it was during it was during the shad. Yep. So, yeah. so I saw two things I'd never seen, just like these swarms of shad everywhere. It looked like birds, really, like these flocks of birds mm-hmm. under the water. Yeah. And then these big green sturgeon, we'd just be you know going up the middle of the of the river on each side. They're they're like. In clear water. In clear water, yeah, like sunning sharks. themselves. Yeah. You know, so it I, was really cool. I spent uh, a few years there at that dam, basically. Well, from there down, uh, I got hired by one of the agencies, the fishery agencies, to tag Spring Run Chinook. They needed to put tags in them. And I said, when they brought me into this meeting, I said, okay, this, you know, they, can, can you catch these things? I said, yeah, I'm sure I can. It's been closed forever, so... I haven't targeted them, but you know I know how to catch spring salmon. They're pretty active. They yeah, bite, they bite. They're pretty bitey, <laughs> and the water's cold and all that, and they're just beautiful. But I, bef- I said before I get excited about this, and then you guys talk about hiring me. Why aren't you just gonna uh, like pull them out of the ladder or something? I mean, you got two ladders going around that dam. You know, I don't want any surprises like you guys say. Okay, you, you know, we're gonna have you do this, and then they go, oh wait, we could just pull them out of the ladder. We don't need you. <laughs> and they said. The study was to see how long they sit below Daguerre Dam because the the ladders have been rumored to be antiquated for so long that they were thinking that the spring run are not using the yeah the ladder mm-hmm. because they hang out in that pool. Right. So my unofficial uh, synopsis of that is they like that spot. It's, it's got some depth and lots of oxygen because come sometime in October, we'd have a million springers there and then all of a sudden, pew, they're gone. And then they had one year, they had me fish for fall run Chinook. And that you would think would be a great spot to fish below the dam. Not so much. So they were gone up river or they were gone. Yeah, they would go. They'd yeah. Go, they'd make w- their w- way. Once the, whatever the trigger was, water temp or whatever, their 
tingling in their loins. They, yeah, right. yeah. They, they bolted upstream when they wanted. It wasn't like the, the ladder was holding them back. And that's what I was going to comment on, actually. I figured, because yeah. you look at that ladder, it's not. It's, it's janky. It, it sure. is. But there's water going through it, right? Yeah, yeah but it needs to be it needs to be redone. Oh, yeah. Big well, it would be nice just to wipe that thing out. Although, right. the flip side, and, and a lot of guys upstream um, talk about, yeah. Let's, Stripers. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say the striper right. would love it if you did that. They would enjoy that trout population up there because yeah, yeah. the trout population below size. there from there down to Yuba City is not, bleak. Nothing. Yeah. not so hot. So, um, but anyway, so point of all that was we, I spent a lot of time right there at that dam for, you know, we'd work five days a week. Yeah. It was a cool gig and so yeah, have cool. a private salmon river because it's closed to fishing yeah. for salmon, you know, so there's never anybody in my hole. And, um, but we would see sturgeon in there quite a bit. Yeah. We, when we went that day, we saw, I think a couple up in that pool that I could, that I could sight. It was, it's super deep as you know. They kind of like to, it's weird. They like to bathe in the sun, you know, they're kind of like to sit in the tail outs and hang out, hang out in the sun. (laughs) They're just like a French bulldog with uh, (laughs) a prehistoric Frenchie. (laughs) Um, I heard that they were going to take, uh, the live oak rock. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good segue, uh, unintentionally there because, um, I also got hired for several years to tag spring salmon on the feather, mm-hmm. and they wanted them somewhere below Yuba City, as far down as possible, because they wanted to see. They were putting acoustic tags in them, and they're like the size of kind of like a jumbo AAA battery, kind of between a triple yep. and a double A. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah, they're, and that's where they'll stand with the antenna, like on a bridge or something, and try to track. Yeah, them, correct? And, and they had. Uh, well, they had uh, receivers in the river that right. would ping. When, as soon as they go by. Fish yep. seven, 17 would go by, and it would ping them, and then they could track their movements up and down. So That's they wanted cool. to see um, where these things, like how long that it was taking those fish to get over that, that live oak dam. And for the purpose of – this was a DWR job that they hired me for, and, and DWR wanted that thing out, the biologists anyway. Mm-hmm. And so it sounds like – I haven't heard the latest, but it definitely sounds like that's moving forward. Now, an interesting thing from that study was um, we were catching springers in May and June, I guess it was, and it was for several years. And the first few years it was really good. We some days we'd catch you know up to twenty a day, and uh, it was pretty fun. <laughs> but uh, um, so we we the last let's see, the last couple of years of it was in the drought years. The water was warm, almost seventy degrees. Wow. And we had a cutoff. If it got to 70, they didn't want us fishing sure. for, for obvious reasons. Sure. And so we were fishing right above Shanghai Falls. I don't know if you've been there, but. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's it, just for the no, listeners haven't. who I'm haven't seen it. I'm shaking my head. No, I should say no because <laughs> yeah. I forget that who haven't, this is only recorded. Who haven't seen it. It looks like uh, kind of when you go to a river and you'll see the clay banks that have little indentations in them. It, it looks like clay rock. You know, mm. that, It's like an old mm. ancient reef ancient, almost. Yep. And, it, and I don't mm. know the actual term. You, you see them on a lot of different rivers. The Umquas fix. Yep. Um, Umqua has them. Well, Hogan was telling me that there's freshwater coral. Is that the same stuff? I mean, no? kind of, I mean, it could almost be like that but it, i don't think it is but it's very similar okay. um but there's a basically a channel that goes right through this clay these clay pass and big embankments on both sides and then just a little chute that goes through the middle of them yeah anyway, it's standing it's, waves and i mean it's yep. probably you know, maybe as twice as wide as this room or something going yeah. through and did you ever see it before it collapsed no no oh. it was it, uh, you couldn't run it really right no it was yeah. it, it basically envisioned a clay just this you know for lack of a better word reef um, across the entire river yep, yep. and it flowed over the top of that because it was like a dam it's like a waterfall almost. and so you mm-hmm. had yeah you had a double um, horseshoe falls oh it was, whoa it was, i thought that was pretty too it was yeah depending on the water level you know when the water was low it'd be six feet high or something and what a what a barrier talk about a good shad spot <laughs> right it's a sh- shoot funnel yeah. yeah and so i think during the drought I mean, I never really heard why exactly this happened, but I think that the drought dried out that clay so much, and then we, we had to, some high water, and it, it broke off. So fell, it broke it a shoot, probably. Yeah. So the the falls were. I mean, there's still a big gnarly rapid that slows stuff down, but the good side to that is the shad wouldn't get up the Yuba in low water years because they couldn't get past that because it's below the mouth of the Yuba several or a few miles, and so now the shad can always get 
up into the Yuba because there'd be years we couldn't catch shad at all in the Yuba. Mm-hmm. It, it was so. stunning how many shad were in there last year that, yeah. that I saw. Yeah. It's crazy. It, it's like that in a lot, a lot of the Valley Rivers. You just can't yeah. see them like right. you can in the Yuba. Right. Right. You know, there's there. It was just fun to throw streamers at them and catch them. You know, you, yeah. you're not going to catch as many as like a more more deliberate method, but it was still a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. Before I get to, we'll, we'll get all kinds of I sidetrack. Know, right, but yeah. <laughs> so on that project on the feather, this was a really eye opener for me for, uh, as far as catch and release goes, because we're obviously when we're tagging fish, we're catching and releasing them. Right. So, and that was interesting. The first year I did salmon tagging and releasing with these, these beautiful springers, it was kind of, they, they're spicy. I, I were they hard oh, handling them and doing all that. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they fight and we, we tried to really bring them in quick as possible and, yeah. and not really right. handle them too much. But right. the, the, the river was, was really full of them back then, man. It was, it was really cool, but, and that has since declined them, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. But the, the point I was trying to get to is this whole catch and release thing. So initially we, we tagged these things and, and I've spent, you know, my house, I always tell people is built with salmon blood, basically, you know, I've, I've been a guide for all these years and that's, you know, I'm, like, I'm the sole uh, breadwinner basically at the house. And so, you know, Sam would have built my house. And so to let these things go at first was kind of awkward. Like, dang, that's a cromer, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that sounds weird because I'm very pro catch and release, but it just was Sam and it's always been a bonk thing. Sure. Yeah. And then, boy, after a few of those, though, I got so like, this is way cooler than, than bonking them. And, and so... We got some data back one year. And so here's the deal. We're, we're anchored above Shanghai Falls. And so we're fishing plugs out the back as these fish come up over the falls and then they, you run into your lures there. And so by the fact that you're anchored above fast water, you don't have the best scenario for quickly landing fish. Or messing up. Yeah, right. I mean, some would take. Because they're going to go downstream. Yeah, and we had that happen. Water. Yeah. But so we'd get them up as fast as we could. And we actually would try to fight them real easy so they didn't have that panic. You just kind of mm-hmm. slowly grind them in, you know, mm-hmm. and, and cause it wasn't about, you know, having a good fight. This was like, let's get them in, let's get them tagged. So we get them tagged and then, or we get them up to the boat. So they bit a plug, right? And, and this, this is intrusive and, and I want to emphasize that because the, the back end of this is pretty interesting. So first of all, we catch them with two treble hooks and then you net them, you put them in a cooler. We used a big. 152 quart cooler with the lid off as a live well in the boat and you throw them in there, not throw them, you set them in there <laughs> and, um, to get the hooks out, get them out of the net, all that. And then what the biologists would do is they take that tag and they had a plunger and they jam it down their throat mm-hmm. all the way to the back of the plumbing, basically until you get as far. Yeah. You know, it's kind of <laughs> you're plunging something down their throat and with fish like resident rainbows or stripers or something that they tag, they do a surgical insert. Right. Right. Cause they're not worried about, or in that, that case, they are worried about plugging up the digestive tract. But when it's a fish on a one way trip, they're, they're not, not gonna, they're not eating stomachs empty. Right. It's a good little suitcase. Yeah. And so <laughs> a little beeping in your stomach. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we've done that. And then they would cut a section off the tail for a DNA sample. Yeah. We'd take a scale or two. And then have you ever seen the spaghetti tags? That go on the back of a fish. They look like a little two inch piece of spaghetti with a almost it looks uh, like a little antenna. Like yeah, sticking out. I've seen the hard antennas, but nothing that's like yeah, it's noodly. Yeah, I mean it's not as it's more like a al dente uh, noodle. You know, it's not. Okay. Gonna, <laughs> yeah, maybe I have them. Yeah, I mean they're they're, they're semi rigid, I guess. I but mean, it's you, like kind of behind their, their yeah, back on either side of the fin. dorsal fin dorsal, on the top, okay. and it's got a, a sharp point with a barb on it, and you have this little tool and you jam it in there so it stays put and it has a code on there so when the carcass crew comes along later and they can see oh that's fish number 37 you know he got tagged blah 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 and so you jam two of these in and they're bleeding and you're thinking sorry fish and then there's a quick photo because they want to be able to identify them yep and then we'd let them go and that year we tagged uh i think it was 35 or 36 fish in 68 degree water so hook them fight them net them poke and prod them and stuff stuff down their throat let them go and we got i think all but one back to the feather river hatchery oh wow wow. yeah 
and the other one went down river. So he may have survived. He just said, yeah. This well, that that's actually pretty cool. I thought the mortality rate would be like 50, 50 or something. Right. And, that's cool. And, and another story when I was doing the fall run, we caught this ginormous buck that was probably close to 30 50. pounds. Oh, nah, not, not that, that big. big, but you know, a big fish. Yeah. And he swallowed a huge quick fish down his throat. And we hadn't caught too many that year. There weren't that many fish in the, it was during the drought. And so the biologist and I looked at each other and was like, well, should we stick one of these $500 tags down this thing? Cause this thing's probably not going to make it. I mean, I had to do pretty, pretty good oral surgery to get this thing out of it. And so we had that cooler, like I was talking about, and normally I'm helping do whatever, you know, helping tag the fish. Well, in this case, there was so much blood in the cooler. You couldn't see the fish in the cooler. Oh shit! And so I was taking the bucket while she was tagging. All I was doing was scoop, you know, blood fresh out, water. fresh. I mean, just yeah. nonstop as fast as I could. And, and again, we're questioning this whole process. Like, what are we doing? So finally we get this fish back in the water and he swims off all just woozy and like, yeah, there was a waste of 500 bucks. But, uh, and then she texted me two weeks later. She goes, Hey, we found the bleeder. He was up by parks bar bridge spawning. And that was an eye opener because I always assume, well, if it's bleeding, you guys might as well throw that one in the box. That They're was- like those B 52s in world war two. They could get like half their tail shot off <laughs> yeah. quarter of their right wing shot off and still do their it, trip and land. It's that indomitable yeah. spirit. To, yeah. I mean, I, there's, I think a Sam, yeah. once he gets in the river, she gets in the river. There's, it's like, man, we're so freaking close here. It's I'm why, not, you it's, can't stop me. It's why bars exist, even though there's tender. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys didn't know this episode was going to be about boats, ladies, and whiskey, huh? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but but by all means. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, pretty cool. That goes back to everything. I, I'd say it every episode that nature finds a way. Yeah, so these know? transponders, I guess, is what they're, is what's in their gut. Yeah, um, acoustic tag. Yep. Do they... Um, can they reuse those? It's, no. That's a good question. Once I was you, wondering that too. Once you pull the pin, kind of like a grenade, okay. they they have a lifespan. And they set okay. them on salmon um, you know, for whatever, two months or 60 days, 50, I don't know, a few weeks or whatever it is. Because they don't want them to continue to ping after the fish dies. They don't want to be getting funky data if it you mm-hmm. know, starts rolling so they don't down. So they don't go and collect them then? No. Okay. No, they're They're huh. done. But they go and download all the different acoustic hydrophone data, and they can see how long. So they do been. like 35, 40 of them a year? Yeah, just depending on how many we caught. Right. Um, one day on the Yuba, or one year on the Yuba, we caught 100 and some odd. So um, that, w- that seems like a pipe dream nowadays, the way things are. But hmm. uh, So do you think taking out that dam is going to help? I mean, that salmon get up there, no problem. So what are they? why are they doing that? Well, low it's water year. dam, but it's the... Yeah. We're, we're still talking about the Yuba, right? That, well, we, diver, I think he jumped back to the feather, to the, the feather rock wall. Yep. Yeah. Live Oak Dam. It's, if you've never been there, it's a giant, basically pile of riprap that they made across the river, a dam to divert water into a aggregational or ag. Is that sunset pitch. pumps? Yeah. 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 Okay. And so it's, it's pretty intimidating. It's impressive. It's it's a big falls and, and low water. It get, gets to be where you'd think it'd be really tough to to pass. And then the flip side of that is it's a great place for predators like pike minnows, stripers, et cetera, to sit there and pick off smolt as they're coming down. Mm. So I think to get that out of there would uh, would be a good thing for the feather. I think the best thing for the feather river is to replumb Thermolito and get cold water. You familiar with that whole system? Yeah, we've talked about it in the past. Just you're talking about how the water comes out of the Orville Dam, goes into the Four Bay, into the After Bay to warm the water, and then yeah. back into the Feather. So it's the, it's the for for a fishery standpoint, it's the dumbest thing ever. Right? You'd never get away with that now. Right? But it's, and I'm surprised, and I don't know enough about rice farming, but apparently, you, know, you put water on a rice field, it's only what six inches or a foot deep or something. Mm-hmm. And if you hit it with that cold water, it really stunts the rice growth. Yep. So it does in the uh, if you think of the rice coming out of the uh, the little gate or the I'm sorry the the water coming out of the gate when it's first introduced into that that acre say say of of rice, it's it makes you know if you hit it with like a thermal, you know basically mm-hmm. a thermal camera from the top. And I've seen actually satellite videos of this because I was working with some folks at uh, one of the watergation districts 
Water irrigation districts. What did water I say? Gation. Water gation. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> anyway, when the water comes out of those those gates, it actually makes a cone, right? Uh-huh. A, a heat cone, and it's it, it dissipates as it enter, enters the more warmer water. But for that that area where it kind of hits the the warm and the cold water meet their yields go way down so, yeah, yeah i mean obviously there was something to it yeah and i so they don't like cold water basically yeah and i i certainly don't disparage them for just totally wanting. counter to it, yeah it was an agreement that they want. set up when they built the dam because the rice farmers were yeah. raising hell about it yeah, yeah. yeah. So and, it's and been, but i as i understand it there's something funky about it. they still take colder water and send it out it just seems like there's a way to plumb it to where you don't have to put that hot water back in the river Maybe deliver the water via a aqueduct kind of thing instead of putting it back hot in the river. Because the, the, one of the great things about Oroville Dam, except for now when we have all this spillway issue, but generally you have cold water. Mm-hmm. That low flow section stays cold, and mm-hmm. you'd have cold water. I mean, that would do wonders for the Feather River, having nice cold flows coming out of that outlet. Mm-hmm. But And I, I guess there's some stuff afoot kind of talking about that. I don't know where that's going. Golden Gate Sam Association has been – involved in some of that so hmm. i need to look more into it because i think that would that'd be a, a good I, fix for that river for sure well the, uh, speaking of salmon i mean you've obviously been doing this forever and and, and when i was a kid the salmon fit you, what could you keep back in the late 90s and early there, there was a couple years three, three you could keep five was it five well there was two jacks or three jacks something like that but yeah. i remember five at one time it's like oh man it's a lot of fish can you guys explain what a jack salmon is for those that don't know yeah, jack salmon is a immature, typically adult, or I mean, uh, male uh, salmon that comes up a year earlier. It's than, about two years old. Yep, yep. Yeah. Most of our fall salmon in the valley here are three-year-old fish. There's some four-year-olds. Those are going to be the mm-hmm. big ones, but uh, most of them are three. And every year, Mother Nature sends up a shot of two-year-olds, and there's some small percentage. And they use that actually as a forecast for the following year. If you have a big jack year this year that is – thought and there's you know there's those very, forecasts are never right right <laughs> well they always they always get them uh, right when it's crummy and then <laughs> right. when they're expecting right. good ones it right. never seems to work out right. but and, and in their defense it's tough to no, figure out how many but the number of jacks kind of is a precursor for what the next run will look like is that the theory it's not hard and fast but yeah they use that as a tool mm. and that's cool so if you have a big jack you're you know at least Hope springs eternal with fishermen. You go, hey, a lot of jacks this year. Next year is going to be good. <laughs> Doesn't always work out. But. I always look at it as a nature's way to keep keep it going, right? I mean, if you have low water conditions, those jacks are going to be able to get into places that the salmon yeah. can't. Right? The it's an jack policy. Yeah. Do, do the jacks return? Do they? No, do they, no. they die too. Then, but they are sexually mature. They come and die as far as being able to fertilize. And the thing that's interesting, we've had all these years where you kill a bunch of jacks, and and people have this misconception that, well, yeah, might as well kill the jacks. They're worth nothing. But they a jack can spawn with a 30-pound hen, and it doesn't mean it's going to be jacks. Mm-hmm. Right. So right. They're, they're a viable tool for spawning. So um, they're, you know, respect the jack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's funny. You say all these people keeping jacks. you got to be careful because a lot of people won't even know that they might have an 8-pound steelhead, yeah. and it could, it could be, you know, it's a – they're catching expensive. they think they're catching jack salmon and they yeah. so always check the mouth if you see a black mouth you got a salmon if there's mm-hmm. a white mouth inside and, and you're look, like the tongue head. the tongue itself or uh right yeah, yeah the inside the inside of the mouth yeah the tongue i think even mm-hmm. yep or just if you're in doubt if it has an adipose fin you're probably okay right <laughs> i mean if it's missing an adipose if it's clipped sorry well, confuse that, people even more no that brings <laughs> up a good subject you 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 had spoken about uh, hatchery fish um, recently on your Facebook page, and it kind of went it went viral. A lot of people talking about uh, the obviously the salmon are lifeblood on these rivers, yep. and um, the droughts taking its toll on it. Water management's taking its toll on it. There are all these factors, et cetera. Right. Um, talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, what I mean, was controversial about it in the comments that you read? Well, and then a lot of people. And you're like or hatcheries are bad. You don't want any hatcheries. We should have, right. you know, we shouldn't have hatcheries. It should be all wild. Yeah, if there were no dams, I totally agree. Well, right. that that's just it. I mean, you look at the state of the valley; it's degraded beyond yeah. recognition. And I use the American for example. The dam is 23 miles up from the mouth where it dumps into the sack. And that's at Folsom. 
Well, Nimbus Dam and then Nimbus. Folsom's okay, above yeah. that. Yep. Nimbus has no passage. That's the end of the line. That's where the hatchery is. Okay. And so you got 23 miles of a river that has, I don't know what the official stat is, but with all the forks above where Folsom Lake sits, it's kind of like Shasta, you know, they blocked off all that. Same thing. Um, there's probably, you know, two, 300 miles of spawning habitat, at least, that is inaccessible now. So they built the hatcheries as mitigation for the loss of that, although the Yuba didn't get one. And there's some of those, uh, the, the San Joaquin didn't get one. So there, there was something going on there, too. I don't know exactly all the politics of all that. But the they built these hatcheries to mitigate for the loss of the fish, uh, spawning habit for the fish. And, and that worked. Now we have this interesting sort of dynamic where they are kind of trying to go back to wild. And I'm all for wild. Wild fish are cool. I mean, that's if if we could have them, great. When I, you know, guiding in Alaska, yeah. I see wild salmon, and it's just awesome to see what a river's supposed to look like. Right. And they don't. They're not supposed to look like what we have here. We but we have humans here, and we have water needs and crops and all that. So I understand why they built. The, I'm not. I'm not going to argue that we need reservoirs. But the fact that we're trying to replace these hatchery systems now with wild and they can't even define wild because in one breath they'll call it a wild fish the next it's naturally spawned it's like well which one is it because i personally believe there are no genetically pure wild fish left in this valley and why i say that is they've had dams for 70 years they had livingston stone built a hatchery up on the mcleod back in the 1800s i mean we've been putting hatchery fish in all these systems and they stray like crazy the sack fish Last few years have strayed ninety four percent or up to ninety four percent. So, there, which to me I don't think sounds like that bad. It seems like that's more like genetic diversity, really. But uh, you know, I'm not a biologist, but you got all this hatchery influence from so long ago that have bred the pure, the pure genetics out of it. So, what are we trying to accomplish? And they they've done all this stuff by trying to get things back to wild and you just can't do it. So we're curtailing plants of fish and we're doing all these kind of going backwards things, you know, and I'm not opposed at all to some of the habitat restoration. I mean, that's great, Mm -hmm. but that alone isn't going to do it in in the Valley. And so it's frustrating to me that I call it the ivory tower PhD syndrome. I think there's somebody in some fisheries office somewhere that is, smarter than us and certainly thinks he's smarter than us and has this pet project that I want it all to be wild again, but doesn't really have a firm grip in the reality of the situation Mm -hmm. and doesn't really understand that the lack of fish affects a lot of people too. I mean, at some point the humans have to have a little, you know, let's, let's, let's take care of the people too. Right. And I've had discussions with uh, when I was on the Yuba, actually, there was a guy who came out. He worked for an organization that was trying to get the Yuba wildfish back, which, again, I, I'm not opposed to. It just let's be realistic here. And we were tagging salmon, so I showed him what we we're doing. And he said, well, how many of these are hatchery fish? And I said, oh, about uh, two-thirds of them at least. And he was just disgusted. And so then I got out my little soapbox. And on the gravel bar, gave a sermon on, and he he never said anything. So I, I figured he'd call my boss and, you know, fire that guy. He's, he's a know-it-all. But what I told him, or, or I asked him, I said, so what's the difference in a hatchery reared salmon versus a quote-unquote wild? Well, let's just say there are native salmon. Okay. So, um, I mean, genetically, yes, there may be some difference, although there's still some question on that. They haven't given us a definitive answer, but... To me, they serve the same biological function. From the time that they're an egg in the river, they get fed on, you know, they they provide food for birds, little fish, whatever. As they become small, they swim down river, they provide food for stuff all the way down. Then once they get out to the ocean, they're trimming the herds of anchovies and krill, and so they're doing their part. And then they come back and they bring all the protein from the sea and nutrients and replenish the river. And so if those two spawn together... I mean, they, they did the same thing. Right. One the, was reared in a, in a building and the other one was in, yeah, the, in the, the gravel bar. And I think probably we need to really upgrade our hatchery practices, get a little more modernized. I think when these hatcheries went in 50, 70 years ago, 
the idea was produce as many fish as you can, which as an angler, I, I can appreciate that. But you also got to do it in a way that makes some sense because you think about the Sac Valley and how many rivers we have and the creeks, all the trips to the Sac in particular. They can only sustain so many fish and, yep. then, it, and then it becomes, right? Remember yeah. The word for that? Carrying, carrying capacity. Carrying capacity. capacity. Yeah. But what I was thinking about was you had all these rivers that each had its own, the the fish that went up Battle Creek had a little different life history than the ones that went up Deer Creek yep. or Clear Creek or whatever. They all they all were different timing to isolate themselves from a catastrophic event. And something, you know, they hit a hot pot of water or something. And if you had all the fish coming down at one time or coming up at one time and something bad happened, I mean, who knows what, but it's, you could wipe, lose the whole run. Well, that's kind of how they do it now. They raise them all up and dump them in all at the same time. And it, I don't think it really simulates the, the natural approach. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, I know that's probably a little pie in the sky because it's, there's, there's a lot of a lot more to it, right? Yeah. Logistics, transport, logistics. Right. Yeah. But I think but I hear you. We could tune this yeah. up a notch and and the McCullumy hatch, you guys have probably been hearing about those guys. They're doing a fantastic job. They are. And I went down and toured it last year. We need to get year. them on. Yeah, we do. He should. Bill Smith is is a really good dude and he knows what he's doing. Um he I went down there just not as member of the media or anybody I, not vp of norcal guys right yeah. i just rolled up <laughs> me and a buddy were just it was just like this time of year and there's nothing going on so hey let's just go down there call me let's at least go look at some fish in a tank yeah, that was pretty much the, <laughs> yeah and we went down there and bill wasn't there who's was the manager and one of his his workers was there and we just said hey what's you know we hear you guys are doing great here what's what's the deal and this dude right off the bat you could see what the deal was. There was passion. I mean, these guys down there really give a shit is what it is. They, and I'm not saying people at other hatcheries don't, but these guys, this is really what, I mean, it's their passion. They're and excited about it. Yeah. And then Bill Smith calls them his babies. Really? Yeah. You, know, you, you ask him about, well, why do you do that? And he goes, well, these are my babies. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and we need that kind of attitude to prevail through the rest. It's the work culture that they have there. You're saying is like their secret sauce then basically. Yeah. It, it's a combination. That's the, the most of it. Uh, there's, it's interesting. We went through and, and this guy was just so passionate. He gave us a two hour tour. I mean, it was like, wow. there was so much to absorb. I couldn't even uh, digest it all. And in fact, I had the guys association go back for an official visit, but just stuff and it wasn't it wasn't rocket science it wasn't it wasn't you know just phd magic stuff it was just common sense and that's kind of the sad thing that common sense is what's lacking yeah that 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 common sense is what's making the difference so here's an example they had a we got there and the the little salmon were just they're still in yeah the yolk sack attached little alvins um, alvins and um those guys were inside in trays and then the trays were divided by little screens. And yeah, I don't know what the, the differentiation was between the, the screens or the troughs, but anyway, they had screens dividing them. And he said that the state screens at the other hatcheries or the ones that they had originally were the mesh was just big enough that those little egg sacks would get sucked into the hole. Fish would get stuck there and they just go and scrape a bunch of dead salmon off every hour or every day or whatever it was and he goes huh what if we made screens with smaller mesh <laughs> I mean, you know <laughs> it's not like some super epiphany yeah, right. but they went hey that makes some sense and so they did that and the whole tour he he was saying we just try to pick up a couple percent here a couple percent there and that whole attitude was pretty evident you know they had twenty thousand fish the last two years on king's it's, it's working and they're just, they have a barging program they, that's working. That's, I think, a huge one. You know, they're barging these fish down in low water conditions and the predators can't get to them. And that's protective custody. Yep. That's huge. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's, that's yeah, I, that's one of the things I'm really advocating for. For the Coleman fish hatchery or everywhere. I yeah. think it's one thing we could do for all three of the main hatcheries is because what the guy, are we that? talking in during drought years or across the board, like in high, wa- high well, water not, years? Not no. high water years when the bypasses okay. are flooding because right. you guys have heard of the Nagiri Project and all that, yeah. where they grow like weeds on the floodplain. Yep. If the water in. water's high, let them go do it naturally. But when it's when it's normal, <laughs> like it is every year, mm. it seems like. Um, that I, I was just thinking about 
what's the one thing or two things we could do as the guides association? This is kind of what came up. James and I were spitballing on what's the most bang for the buck. How can there's all these little things that we get involved in and you you kind of get bogged down. Let's, let's, let's go for a home run. And so I started saying, Hey, you know, barging makes a lot of sense to me because the reason they trucked, I mean, it's obvious that the trucking gets them past all the, Mm -hmm. all the hot water and predation and, and, and getting sucked down the wrong channels down in the delta you know the georgiana mm-hmm. slough and the delta cross canal and that stuff takes a lot of fish the wrong side of the delta but then they lose their way they don't know how to get back the imprinting right is right so that's barge. where barging comes in you put them in water of their their origin and truck them down without any any predation and and one of the things that that is always an argument against doing more fish because we've as an association have fought for let's let's raise more fish yeah. i mean let's right. let's do something here and they always say well they're going to compete with wild fish and then i start getting into that yeah show me a right. wild fish are they competing with naturally spawned hatchery fish or are they competing with true wild fish that's <laughs> you know so so with barging i think a, a good pro of this whole thing is okay you got your wild fish quote unquote swimming down the river at the same time well all these hatchery heathens that we don't want intermixing with those guys are in protective custody, like I said. So they can't, you know, the little, the, the wild fish, quote unquote, have the ability to feed unmolested because these other guys are in a, in a boat, basically. Mm-hmm. And so once they get to the ocean, I mean, come on, are they really going to outcompete each other? I mean, that's a big body of water. At that mm-hmm. point, let them do their thing. But the biggest issue for salmon in this state, and you can, you know, I'm over, super, oversimplifying this, but the biggest issue is getting fish and steelhead, getting fish out to sea. Mm-hmm. That's our biggest issue. We're getting, Somewhere between a quarter and one percent, yeah, not one percent is really high of our adults back that we, our, our babies back as adults that we send wow. out. That's why we have to release thirty million or whatever and it is. You're talking Coleman specifically, or just in All general? Coleman, Nimbus, Feather. So what's the what's the McCall Colme return percentage? Do you know? Well, they they are doing. Um, I don't know how many of their fish they're doing barging, but they have been doing barging. There's been some pilot mm-hmm. studies. There was one done on the feather as well, and those results are like 4%. And so you start talking about, say, 10 million fish released out of Coleman or you know, pick a hatchery, Feather River, mm-hmm. whatever. And instead of getting a quarter of 1% back, you get 4%. I did the math. I can't remember if I did 12 million or 10 million, something like that. But basically, the number of adults getting back used at 4% return was like 300,000 or 350,000. And if you got 350,000 back to all three of the major rivers, you got a lot of people happy, a lot of businesses doing well. Mm-hmm. You've got the rivers getting nutrients back because there's no spawners in the rivers anymore. So the rivers aren't getting that replenishment of, mm-hmm. of the nutrients. So uh, I'm sure I'll get some resistance somewhere on this one, but it just makes sense to me. And, and I'm, I'm probably not thinking, I mean, again, I'm not a paid biologist but there's it seems to me if you could get them out and, and and another thing to sort of sway the department with is you know they, they don't want to raise more fish well this method if you can get better returns you don't you could even probably curtail the releases right, right. And, and and so i don't know it just seems like common sense sort of <laughs> yeah I, did we did we ask the guys at fish bio at uh, fish bio if the the fish that are in the river are even you know, are wild, quote unquote wild. Well, yeah, just making that ar- argument, right? You know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I know. That's why. But I, did we talk to one of, one of them? I, I thought we did, but I don't want to put words in their mouth, so I'll we'll follow up on that. That could be an episode unto well, itself. The I genetics think. are yeah. there, right? I mean, the genetics yeah. are there. So if it's yeah. a wild or hatchery, it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. The genetics are there, I, and the fish are there. So I, I kind of feel like it's uh, it's going to fall into the um, you know, if you go buy fruits in in Rayleigh's and it says it's gen- it's you know, it's uh, GMO, GMO free. That's bullshit. Cause yeah. they're at some point that's been touched. Yeah. It may not, or, you know, um, that's, that's a good analogy. I actually, think yeah. everything below the dam is any dam is probably, I agree with you, man. It's, it just makes sense. There's hybrid hybridization that's taken place over 70 years, right? Yeah. Not hybridization, and, but, um, wild and, and yeah. hatchery raised fish breeding. And I don't know that, I'll see how there couldn't be. Yeah, no. And and especially because we don't mark 100% of our Chinook. We we clip the adipose fin on 100% of our steelhead, but we only do 25% of 
of kings. And so that makes it hard to tell. It seems like if you mass marked them, then you, at least you have a little better idea what's what. But is is a fish that we raise in the hatchery, goes out to sea, comes back, pulls up short and lays eggs in the river. I mean, is that fish inferior? It seems to me if it made it back, it you know it did its job. Right. And it beat exactly. the odds and, and, yeah. and it's strong enough. And so... And how many of those have to spawn together before – how many generations does that take to make a, quote, wild one? I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. Boy, you, <laughs> when you first started talking about the spring run in the Yuba, like I, my ears went – and then you started talking about the spring run in the feather. Well, can you even classify sometimes like those fish anymore? Ah, well, right? the official you know? definition is July 1st. Right. They, they turn into pumpkins and become fall run. <laughs> because we couldn't fish for spring run tagging purposes after July 1. Right. And so I, I went to one of these meetings because they had me fishing for fall run on the Yuba that one year. And I I sent them some pictures of, hey, we got put some tags in fall run. And they said, well, how do you know? I said, okay. And, and, and this was just super fortuitous. I, I mean, I can tell, but – just because the guides, the guide's eye doesn't hold up in a you know a court of law, right? <laughs> like I can, uh, those springers were just, I mean, just right. liquid. I mean, they're right. just so just. <laughs> I, oh, I get it. I've sexy, caught a, I've so sexy. Caught them on accident. And I know I've what you're talking about. Uh, they're uh, they bite. I mean, you can get them on flies. You know? I've yeah. seen them all rot. You know, like chewed. I'll show you nasty. a picture. But okay. so that year, when we we're fishing for fall fish, I recaptured three or four of my spring run and uh, because they had tags in them and they were all sitting still behind the gear point down. And so, Oh, Hey, fish number seven, how you doing? I haven't seen you since May, you know, <laughs> and the springers in August or September, whenever that was, we were catching them were the bronzy blacky, you know, eh, getting pretty dark. They've been sitting in fresh water for two or three months. The fall run kings still had, they were a little blushed, but they were chrome ish. You know, they were shiny. And it was very obvious to me what, which ones king. I mean, I don't know if you, genetically they're the same or not. I mean, they, the biologists tend to call them sprawl run. They said they're all mixed together. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's a whole nother subject. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, it, it makes me think about uh, Eagle Lake. Mm -hmm. And Eagle Lake, they have their hatchery program. They're starting to, and I think I maybe we've talked about this already, but they're starting Without. to weed out the, you know, they were, they were spawning brothers and sisters together, right? And they didn't know the genetic code between, you know, right. which one, what family was with who. So they had these like kind of weird outcomes of these fish and they just looked funny and they were you know it's all bad. looking similar. And <laughs> You know, it gets bad if there's a demolition derby that starts in the middle of the lake. <laughs> 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 anyway. But maybe maybe these hatcheries need to incorporate that genetic testing into I don't know. Actually, you know? Uh, uh, McCallum's doing some of that. That's another yeah. thing. I, okay. I'm glad you brought that up because I'd forgotten about that. But okay. they, they they are said, actually genetically testing these fish yep. before they spawn them. Yeah, they were the putting other. family groups with family groups, and they had what I always thought would be cool, and they had it there a raceway that was like a river. It had gravel in it. They actually had steelhead spawning in their raceway. That's bit, see, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah and they that makes and, sense. And that mm. that. McCullamy River Hatchery is huge. It's you think of it as a little podunk place out there in the middle of nowhere. It's got more raceway space than than the American for mm. sure. Wow! And so they also did things just to circle back to that real quick. But they again just common sense stuff. They said, okay, we're going to do whatever we're going to do to this batch of fish. We want to see how it works out. We're going to keep those all in this tank instead of throwing them all together. So we can't, you know. And they would tag them the same. And so just little things, just all the little things they, they, when they would take fish out of the hatchery, put them in a truck to go take them to release sites. They learned that if you put a little salt in the water and I don't know how much salt, but some, something made the fish, I don't know if it makes them either easier to smolt once they hit that brackish water. That's probably just what kind it of is, primes yeah. them, I bet. Yeah. It does, the you know, smolting probably takes it. It starts that process yeah. probably. And they, they found that the survival was way better with that. What a trip. And they recommended that to some other hatcheries, which refused. And it's just that kind of stuff where you go, really? Come mm. on. I mean, these guys, they've figured out, they got the blueprint. Just let's, let's follow. Right. I mean, I'm sure it, Everything doesn't apply to all the different hatcheries, but they've got some concepts down there that are obviously working. Mm. It's got to be tough to manage 
something like that. Right? The environmental variables, y- yeah, of predation, yeah, I mean, yeah. To keep fish it passage, clean, uh, those are all X know? factors on each river. And we we talked about it the when the dam was going to give way in Oroville, and all the mud came into the hatchery. Mm-hmm. They yeah. used the city water. They filtered it. Used the city. What pumped them back through the? They basically MacGyvered a, yeah. their mm-hmm. way out of the mess. Yep. Took them down to the annex. The ones that yeah, you know, they just well, they just put fresh the the. Um, turbid water was going to choke out the, right. the, the small fish, so they cleaned it up. Yeah, I mean, I mean they did the best they could. I, right. That was a pretty Herculean effort, really, to yeah. to save what they could. I mean, that was that was above and beyond. You know, I mean they're they're down there doing that when they could lose their life potentially mm-hmm. if that dam goes. So, right. you know, kudos to those guys for you yep. know, doing what they could. They still lost a bunch of fish, but I mean, in in light of the situation, could have been a way worse. Oh yeah, they they did a great job. So. so there's no hatcheries in Alaska. There are. Oh, there are. Yeah, quite a few actually. Yeah, uh, not where I am. I'm on the Togiak, Southwest Alaska. Talk. Tell us about that. We got. We would jump right into some conversation. But obviously, you're you're doing a lot of guiding, and uh, some of it's in Alaska. Talk, talk to us about that. Yeah. Well, just to back up, I've been guiding like I said since August 28, 1998. And How come you know that specific date? I because we limited out that day, and then I don't think I caught a limit of salmon the rest of that summer. <laughs> and I remember that That's day because I only had one guy. We launched at the River Reflections on the low flow, and I ranged a shuttle with the guy Jack who ran the place. And we went down the first hole. We caught well, using my bloody, ugly bait and all the stuff I didn't, you know, quick fish without sardine wraps, all the stuff I didn't know yet. Uh, I was catching fish despite myself, which tells me there were a lot of fish back then. And we uh, we caught his two and caught my two, and I drug the boat back up to the launch ramp because I didn't want to wait for a shuttle. It was only like 9 o'clock in the morning and went home. And a buddy of mine came by. I was back in sack, you know, scrubbing my boat out. My feathers uh, puffed up pretty big. You know, I'm just a <laughs> professional guy, and I lived it out early. Uh, you know, this is going to be easy. And he comes by and he's like, hey, dude, I'm so excited to hear how your day was. I'm like, yeah, we got him. We got him. We got him. I was like too cool for school, you know. We got him. We, we limited out, man. We limited out. And then the fish god said, <laughs> oh, yeah, grasshopper. <laughs> You're screwed now, pal. <laughs> and, and, and things uh, I, I learned quickly that uh, guiding, because I thought I was pretty hot shit, to be honest, because I fished on the American and the feather. And I didn't realize it at the time that – because me and my buddies did really well. Well, I didn't realize how good the fishing was just in was general just, back then. just after the flooding that took place. The fish counts were Yeah, through the roof. High, 2002. Yeah. Well, actually, I was guiding them. But going back before that, early 90s, I guess, um, I, you know, we'd go out and catch fish. And then I realized once I started guiding, like, you have lots to learn, Grasshopper, because I was getting my ass kicked. And it was because it dawned on me later that, Oh, I used to catch a lot of fish because we would only go, you know, maybe on a Wednesday when there was some cloud cover, nobody <laughs> on the river, the flow was just right. I mean, we'd dial it in. I didn't have to go when the north Every wind day. was blowing, the river was coming up, there was 100,000 boats on the river on a weekend, and and quickly I learned, oh, crap, I'm wind way over my head. So Did you hear him say the north wind blowing? Oh, yeah, I God. did. <laughs> Evil. Evil. <laughs> you think the moon has any effect on fishing? It does. It does very, very do you much. Fit, so. Do you not like to fish on full moons? I don't. What's the theory? Why well, do you think? Well, you, the one you always hear is fish feed all night, which with salmon that doesn't really apply, right? But mm-hmm. they move. They're moving. Yeah, they move, and I don't know. I mean, the the freaking thing moves tides, so I <laughs> it has some sort of. I mean, it makes people crazy. It makes fish crazy. I mean, I, something- what about barometric pressure? Barometric pressure sucks too. Although uh, a dropping barometer, you know, you get that north wind, and uh, that's a bad one. Uh, rapidly falling barometer sucks. You know, you get especially. I think what happens in say the valley. I, I think about it, like we used to get like one weird rainy day in August or a cloudy day in August on the feather. It seemed like every year, just some out of the blue one day, and the fish didn't bite that great. And I think it was because. There was so much high pressure normally here in the valley that it was such a dramatic change that it just gives them a headache or something. I mean, I don't know what it does. Yeah. But in Alaska, that doesn't apply because it's crappy, you know, bouncing barometer all the time there. So those fish, I think, are just accustomed to that. Mm -hmm. Whereas our fish get kind of, I mean, it's just the weather here in the summer falls the same for so long. You get a little change and they kind of, I think that's the deal. It's like it depends on that fish's environment, what they're used to. And if it's 
if it's uh, outside of their norm, then they just kind of, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> maybe I'll just not eat for six hours, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I uh, had to learn all that stuff and <laughs> still learning. That's that's the thing. I, you know, I've had some of my guide buddies say, dude, why do you read so much and you know, talk to people? I and mean, that guy at the boat right, was a total gomer. And like, you know, what, what do you got to gain? I'm like, hey, there, every, there's a nugget everywhere. If you, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think the minute you stop trying to improve, it's time to, you know, let's go do something else. Lifetime, and, and also, like, before we hit record, we were talking about um, we the angling community tends to be kind of, you know, I would say vertic, not vertically integrated, but just kind of in their own little fiefdom. So some there's bait <laughs> guys and there's there's lure guys and there's bass fly, guys, there's fly guys, guys, and bass, fly guys. And we all hate each other. <laughs> but I think that that's changing. Actually, you know, I I really do, and I'm starting to see a lot of gear influence in fly fishing. Mm-hmm. You know, the way rigs are set up, swivels. Yeah. Like no one would use a swivel probably that, ten years ago, right? That bubble and fly thing Bobbers, we were talking the about, the float and fly yeah. stuff from bass. You know. Uh, that's it's a good thing, and I think a lot of people need to keep talking. Oh, like that's it. that's that's absolutely like true it. because the the whole thing that fly fishermen are all elitist jerks is totally untrue, and that all bait fishermen are you know scumbag, <laughs> you know bottom feeders. That's not true. I mean, it, everybody. The bottom line is everybody just wants to go fishing and have a nice yeah. time on the river, and, yeah. and and who cares how you do it? I mean, my I'm I'm I swing both ways. <laughs> <laughs> I'm by when it comes to fishing. <laughs> I uh, I always tell people I love fly fishing, but generally I like catching fish better. So there's times when fly fishing absolutely is way more effective. Mm-hmm. And there's times where I go, like, I, I don't want to go catch a marlin on a fly where you have to troll a bunch of stuff behind a boat, get them teased up, and then slap something. I mean, if that's your thing, that's fine. It's just not for me. Right. Um, I For me, I'd rather be – fly fishing on a river somewhere is really kind of my thing but uh but i you know i don't mind rubbing some row on my waders either and mm-hmm. and and i think that's what you're talking about they just yeah just can't we all get along <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah i mean the, the common the common thing and the reason i think everyone should talk to each other is the fish behavior doesn't change right you know, yeah, you can learn a lot from the you guy can learn that a lot of just talking to some dude that may not be in your. There's a million different ways space, to present but, that lure or fly or whatever, yeah. but the, did, the did fish you guys be the same. Ever talk to Bill Lowe no. on the Yuba? He was a guide and and one of those FFF certified. I know, great who, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, he unfortunately he's he was only you know 48 or something. He passed away a few years ago, and he was oh. he was a great guy. B Lowe was wasn't the, it at the gravel like on the yeah he had done a drift yeah. as I understand it and then rode his bike. It was a hot day up yeah. a hill to get mm. his truck, and they found him in his truck. And, right, super sad. And yeah. he was, I mean, he was just lean muscle. It was like he wasn't some slob guy. He was mm-hmm. really fit. But I, I love that guy because anytime I'd see him, I'd be yeah, he might be in a cruddy mood, and then like this guy's throwing his stuff into the trees ten times in a row, and I'm getting a little grumpy, and then float by Bill and well, hey, Bilo, what's up? Just a beautiful day on the river, bro. And I'd be like, oh yeah, that's right. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Bill. <laughs> but uh, he uh, he one time getting back to the, uh, the the talking to each other concept, he said, hey, because he was his swing guy. That was his big thing. Sure, he taught a lot of swing lessons. He he would he would dummy dot indicator fish too, but he was a swing guy. You know, really through tug is the drug. Yep, and. So he goes, hey, I want to come steelhead fishing with you, uh, book a trip with you, and I want to pull plugs. I'm like, why? <laughs> uh, the tug is the drug on that too, by the way. But, <laughs> but he goes, I just want to see like the colors and how your thing moves and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that's Smart. that's pretty slick right there, my man. That was, you know, I, I had a lot of respect for him because he's like, I just, well, you know, got to learn yeah. something. And I'm like, I'm not charging you to go fishing, dude. Come on. <laughs> I saw a guy on the a guide on the coast. He had he he had three fly rods out the back of the boat, and it looked like he was basically fishing plug style, you know, but with three fly rods out the back. Really, downstream, yeah. facing downstream. Yep. He was just slowly back rowing it and walking it down. Mm. So that that's plugs, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah they do out that. the back and they set, step it down the river. Yep. I've yeah. seen that on the Rogue where they do that float through the wild and scenic where they stay overnight in those cabins. And uh, I've had customers that have done that trip, which sounds awesome. But they put on some sort of, you know, leachy 
you know, I don't know what they're using, but maybe it's more like a silver Hilton y kind of thing. But anyway, a dry line and they just get to the tail outs. Yep. And they strip the line out and just kind of twitch it yep. back and forth in the back troll. Sit. It's a popular method on the Klamath too. Yeah. yeah. They'll just use shooting heads and like you're talking about, swing the boat back and forth across the tail out and I wonder if that'd work pick, on Fall River. Pick fish up that way. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it would. Mm. It's not I'm as sure many tail outs and stuff on that though. Yeah, there? It's just a lot of fish. Yeah, well, if you have a lot of fish, that helps. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for a lot of fish. Which is mm-hmm. uh, going back Alaska, right? I mean, is that the big difference? More fish than people when you go? Yeah, to you know, talk, what's say Alaska in like in one sentence when it comes to unfricking believable. <laughs> it's pretty sick up there. Just <laughs> yeah, just the topology of it and just how much water. And the wildlife what, diversity. It's what really strikes me being on the Togiak. I used to got on the New Shigak as well. These are all Bristol Bay, where they want to build that stupid pebble mine thing. But the 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 Togiak is just you you, you go. Ah, oh, this must be what the sack used to be like. And this must be what the feather used to be right. like before it was really messed with by you know, humans, undammed, of course. So they rely on you know rain and snow. But we, where the lodge I work at is, is down in the estuary. So it's, it's basically the, the Delta for lack of better term. There's lots of braided channels and stuff and everywhere you go is like you would hear when you look on the sack over the side of the boat, it's a million squawfish there. It's just so many baby salmon, you know, next year's batch or the year after's batch. It's just, it's so awesome is there's woody debris and there's weeds and all this, this habitat that's pristine. The gravel's clean. And you go to the eel or something where they've done so much log at the mad. And you step out in the gravel and you get this big poof plume of silt. Still, it's not not that way. That gravel's clean and just and and I can remember one day a couple of years ago it was during silver season. I was running up river, water was low, and it was a sunny day, and I could see both margins of the river. And there were like for ten miles there was a nonstop school of silvers on both sides. I mean, Damn. I must have gone past you know hundred thousand fish Easy. or something. Yeah, and it just you just go, wow, the biomass is, that's where it just blows your mind. Yeah. That's why when you guys said that you were worried about the carry capacity on the, the hatch, if the hatcheries like all start doing real, their jobs yeah. really well, I I don't think it would be an issue. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. No. I mean, we got yeah. a long ways to go to get to that. Yeah. Way. In 2002, yeah. we had 750 some odd thousand Chinook back up the central Valley. And that's when they started going, Oh, we got too many fish spawning on top of each other. I'm thinking, you know, why if it ain't broke, <laughs> right? And it's not if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it ain't broke, don't break it. And that's what seems to. And, and I would argue if the ones that uh that win the spawn the spawn game, they're probably going to be a better yeah a more hardy fish, sure, right? Sure, sure. You would uh, think you've know. won the genetic lottery. You've yeah. uh, you've done yeah. it. You've- I, th- I think uh, one of the coolest things I think about Alaska is, and I've seen you, you run in some of these small streams in your jet boat, you know, going up so river fun. and then, so and fun. then you pop up into a lake and then you can go up into another stream. I mean, there's well, what I don't see. Not get lost. <laughs> well, that's part of the fun. And yeah. you just hope there's not a grizzly bear waiting around one of those corners to clothesline you. I remember one time I was going up a Creek called the Iowithla on, which flows into the Nushigak and it, this, these creeks are real windy, as you've probably seen in the videos, and, and you know, a deep holes three feet or something. And you got to be on step for the most you part. You got to be going fast. Yeah. And you're jumping logs. Like, I have a video that I haven't posted yet because I don't want, don't want the owner to. That uh, sounds, Nick's like, that's Nick's thing. Up. He'd love to jump a log. Oh, yeah. I jumped a beaver dam last summer up there, and I haven't posted it because <laughs> Still works. I don't want the owner to go, dude, what are you doing to my boats? <laughs> but we we're going down this little channel. I was like, rut row. <laughs> Beaver Dam. Oh, well. <laughs> when in doubt, hammer the throttle. But do you guys run tunnel jets that's up there? Just, that boat nice. was, yeah, yeah. 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 You, 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 most of our boats though on the Togiak are props because it's a shallow river, but pro, uh, pumps are so inefficient that gas is five bucks a gallon or whatever, and so they just figure they'll buy a few extra props. And the variety up there—that's that's what really is spectacular. Um, one year I was up there in 2014, I think it was, the king fishing was just the pits and the lowest they'd ever seen. And who knows what happened that year. But the 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 adults, I mean, there'd be times when all nine or ten of the guide boats would come back for lunch and there'd be like one fish on the cleaning table. And it's like, Ooh, whoa, that's a rough day. 
And so when people get in the boat that year, they're like, how's fishing? You know, because they're there for four or five days. I say, well, have you been here before? And if they said, yeah, I'm like, eh. <laughs> but if you haven't been there before, I can show you a lot of cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Because that year, we, I mean, I have no way of guessing the number, but I've never seen so many jacks. There must have been a half a million jacks or so. I mean, some insane number of jacks. And so you could catch jacks on anything you wanted, beads under an indicator. I mean, oh, my God. <laughs> Swinging, stripping, on bait. I mean, bait was stupid. I mean, no, no point even using bait. Um, and so we'd go, you could catch literally, you know, I could take the two of you guys out on the boat, and whatever method you wanted to fish, we'd catch a fish on every cast the entire day. And, and that year it was jacks. At the same time, you have chums, these Dolly Varden that are, I mean, sometimes I've netted them thinking they were sockeye. They're so bright and so big. Wow. You know, seven pound dollies mm-hmm. or something. Yeah. And uh, so there's a bunch of dollies. We've caught rainbows to about 12 pounds, 13 pounds, something like that. <laughs> Is that like Alaska's pike minnow? Those dollies? Yeah, they are. They, I call them Alaskan squawfish. Yeah, exactly. Really? Yeah. <laughs> with, with, with love, though. Right, I mean, they're, right. they're cool. And, and it's cool. And when I go in the king season, which is mid June to mid July, they're chrome. I mean, chrome as chrome can be. And then the years I've gone back for silvers in August and September, they're up the creeks following the sockeye and the kings to eat the eggs and talk about a, a bead fishing adventure. Um, but they they get that really charry looking, like a giant brook trout, just flame mm. colors on them. And they're so, so cool, cool looking. What's they, the best one to eat out of all those? Well, we don't really eat any of the rainbows or char the uh the the salmon species that's that's sort of a personal thing isn't it pinks no that's no, the lowest no, that's the lowest one yeah no, chinook sockeye and, and it's sockeye sockeye was the one i'm thinking of yeah sockeye mm. red, that's a really bright red meat yeah, right yeah. yeah and they're sometimes for some people they're too rich and hmm. so king silver sockeye those are the three biggest chum it's interesting you know you hear them called dog salmon mm-hmm. and the natives up there like we won't eat these. We feed them to our dogs, and 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 I thought, well, they're still a salmon, right? They I mean, fight really well, though. I read they do. They yeah. they and they bite. I mean, there's a lot of them. There's nothing really to dislike about them. But uh, I thought, okay, they're still a salmon, and I realized, well, Alaskans. I mean, they have all those other ones, <laughs> right? Plus halibut and all this other right. stuff to eat. So why why eat a chum if you don't have to? So <laughs> well, the Japanese didn't eat toro for a long time. The belly the yeah. belly part of the tuna, Whoopsie. right? <laughs> <laughs> so what one year up there the cook said, Hey, let's do a taste test and and bring bring a nice chrome chum in and uh which those are kinda hard to find because they color up, they spawn low in the river, so they start coloring up out in the salt. So we got a nice couple bright chum and he barbecued king and chum and they were in separate platters, so everybody knew which was which and the the just chum the Pepsi challenge. Yeah, exactly. Was the white king in there? No, no, no just regular king okay. and, and, and regular <laughs> regular chum. The chum's a little paler in color. I mean, it's a little more trouty for, you know, mm-hmm. as good a description as I can get, but a little less bright orange. So we all take a bite of the chum. And it's like, yeah, that's fine. You know, if you had that in a restaurant, you, no one would ever say anything. They go, that's good, fresh fish. And then you take a bite of the king next to it. You go, oh, okay, I can see it's it's just richer. It's got more uh, salmon flavor mm-hmm. to and I'm not, I mean, I love raw salmon. That's, mm-hmm. I mean, I can eat too. that for Me days. Too. Yeah. Cooked salmon I'm fine with, but it's not my favorite. Raw is way better. So, yeah, it, raw on all fish pretty much. But if, uh, I mean, I almost thought I'd rather almost eat the chum because it's less, mm. has less salmony flavor. Mm-hmm. As, as, as it probably like, would eat better raw. It might. It might. Yeah. It's not as fatty though, so that might mm. that might be a, a little hang up. But I don't know, it's something to try. We do... The the chefs up there do sashimi for us every day. Really? Pretty much. Oh, man, that's awesome. guy. What's this? So what's this lodge called? Togiak River Lodge. It's uh, you got it every what, year. What's it a week? It's like forty five hundred bucks. It's not cheap. Yeah. It's, uh, but it's it's one of those bucket listers. You, I mean, you flying to catch a can and then puddle jump? No, you're you're. Uh, it's you're a way in further up. You go to Anchorage, and then you go southwest of there, four hundred miles. Oh wow! Okay. Now, if you envision a map of Alaska. Where the Aleutians start to peel off the mainland, it's over in that corner, the southwest corner. Uh, mostly conventional, or um, yeah, in the king season for sure. Yep. Silver season, a lot of fly fishing, mm-hmm. and and you could catch the kings on fly. In fact, there's um, some people that go up there to try it every year. Yeah, 
and it's it's not laid out perfectly for fly fishing for there's some swing corners and stuff and we've taken guys out and and you know they don't catch anything and they they get tired of it I'm like well, hey you want to run a glob of eggs through there just to see if there you know there's nothing in there well try this oh crap there's a lot of them in there <laughs> so it, it doesn't lay out perfectly it's kind of it's a big river so it's yeah. not ideal for for kingfish on the fly, I mean, you can do it, but the silvers are stupid. I mean, yeah, top water is a silver coho. Yep, yeah, yep. yeah. yeah the, I fished for those on the, op- the open ocean out there. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, the in the river, in that lower river, like you say, top water. That's the thing that is I so couldn't fun. imagine catching a silver on a fly rod on a river. That would just be amazing on a surface plug. Yeah, I mean, or and they hit, popper. they chase it down. Right. It's so fun. I've, Boom! I've posted some videos of conventional top water fishing up there where i'd buy take bass plugs and paint them pink because silver's mm-hmm. i mean you could throw you could throw a hot dog in there if you painted it pink you know i mean they they seem to be drawn to that color and and it's just so cool and, and that i got into that because we're literally catching for two guys close to 200 silvers or more a day and like for 30 straight days it's just obscene it's incredible and so i get bored quick you know i mean that's it's a lot of unhooking of silver. So <laughs> the f- one year I was up there I was thinking, God, what, what can I do to make this more interesting? And so I brought some little bass plugs to pike fish. I thought, well, we got some pink spray paint. And then so we started going, putting just a single sidewash barbless on those. And, and, uh, so fun. That, I don't get why it has to be pink. You know, the, again, these fish are in a dark environment looking into a light environment. It probably doesn't <laughs> have to we be just, right. Yeah. <laughs> we have all these things we think we know. So I have a question. Um, you've obviously driven a lot of boats. Um, I know we're getting off subject, but tunnel hole versus just a regular flat bottom. I'm getting to be uh, very much into the tunnel hole. In fact, my new 25 foot sled, the tunnel hole. Mm-hmm. God, I love that answer. You yeah. know why? Cause I've got a uh, low 1860 tunnel tunnel that's being delivered. Excellent. My buddy and I went in on nice. Yeah. That, the last year actually was the first year up there that we had a tunnel boat and I've never had one and I'd heard some mixed reviews on performance. I'm wondering yeah, about the sliding, right? I like, yeah. I have the tiller and yeah. I'm sliding around in my low, like I'm surfing. Does it grab a lot more than it didn't seem it, to It just still slides around like yeah. it should. Huh? Yeah. Mm. Cause that's all I ever run is tillers too. I, I, I can't drive a steering wheel boat. I'll crash it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we had a, a 18 foot, Kind of like the one you're talking about, low. It was some other brand, Aluma Craft or something. And it had a big tunnel, like uh, like the one on my big sleds, probably only I don't know three four or four inches. inches. Yeah, this one's probably seven. I think it was wow. actually for a prop, a tunnel prop. Right. For the people that don't know what a tunnel hole is, can you explain what a tunnel hole is? That's probably a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> so with a jet boat, of course, the the bottom end of it, the suction part is the intake. The intake or, or shoe is. You know, because it's kind of shoe shaped. Mm-hmm. You've got that big corkscrew in the bottom that sucks the. It's a very inefficient way to propel yourself. You suck water up and then shoot it out like a fire hydrant. But the the idea of the jet is you can run shallow water because the bottom of that intake is mounted basically flush with the bottom of your boat. Well, that still is your weak point because typically when you hit something, the sort of the ass into the boat is dragging, and you hit your you hit your motor and and you know if you hit the boat on a rock it's not that big a deal typically but you can break that cast aluminum of your intake and then you're then you're really in trouble you're, yeah you're screwed so a tunnel on these tunnel boats they and they're they're usually all aluminum i guess they have a god how do you describe it? just a little just a recessed yeah the bottom of the boat the last couple feet or three feet whatever it is um is lift, a notch cut out yeah and so water can they, they, you, you mount the motor higher so it's above the bottom of the boat. And the transom's like four or six inches higher than normal, yeah, right? Yeah. So the whole, by default, the whole engine raises. Yeah, and so then your intake is, if you were hit something at the back of the boat, you're hitting the bottom of the boat, not the not the intake. Motor, yeah. So, um, that's, so yeah, you'll see video of guys, uh, you know, hopping across sandbars to another flat section or something like that. That's they're all running tunnels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was curious. Cause I've Chad is I've, I've never personally driven one, but I was worried about that, you know, having a little bit more of an edge to work with, you know, yeah, and, and actually just grabbing all of a sudden grabbing and going you. instead yeah. of like sliding a little bit more in, across that riffle or whatever it might be. Uh, well, that was, 
uh, the first time I'd driven mm-hmm. one, especially with that pronounced of a tunnel, and mm-hmm. you'd think it would show more on that. Mm-hmm. And I was ripping around corners doing the slide thing, no problem. I mean, everybody's going to be different how the motor's mounted and all that. But right, right. My my big one, my new one, my twenty five doesn't have any issues with that either. So See how many people you fish out of a twenty five foot boat? You can take six. Wow. And uh, I I'd always run a twenty footer and four max. And then, because I, <laughs> my dad says, oh, now you're the guy you make fun of all these years, the the cattle boat guys. And, <laughs> and I said, yeah, well, I, you know, you got to, you got to adapt. What what happened was I'd get enough calls for five and six that it was painful to turn those people away. Yeah. And so, and, and it costs $427 a day to show up. That's what, you know, when you average up all the costs of fuel insurance boat payments i mean mm. everything tackle I, I did that calculation a few years ago and so even if you have four guys you know people think that that guiding is oh these guys are just making a you know killing it's it's a labor of love is what it is and so to be able to put you know if i have four guys i'm really only getting paid for two above breaking even but those other two you, puts you yeah your margin like right there yeah you start that starts yeah. to make it make more sense so mm-hmm. so i you know, I don't do six every day, but uh, to have it there is a it's definitely and, and and people like it because they go, oh, we'll bring Uncle Larry next time, and you know whoever, we, oh, we can bring the kids. He got room. Cool. Um, okay, so speaking of tunnel we were, holes, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, so when we were we before we started recording, we were talking about. Um, you said you've been writing for industry stuff since like the nineteen ninety one. Okay, early nineties. Yeah, oof. you've seen kind of the the whole impact of say technology specifically um social media Indeed. on the sport you know how what do you think some of the positive stuff is what do you think some of the the bad stuff is and how do you feel about it in general i think it's a good way i'm gonna break cut yeah. into this one because i think it's a good way to educate people but i think it's mm-hmm. put more pressure on our fisheries than we've ever seen before in our lives absolutely it's it's kind of a love hate thing really mm-hmm. i man it's it's great because people have a, a new avenue to learn stuff. And, and, and when you're learning, that's cool. But also I think it takes a little of fun out back in the day when you had to you know, go find this lake that was just on a map. There's no information about it. You had to go there and, and, you know, put, put in the sweat it. equity experience, the adventure adventure. Yeah. yeah. Now you can YouTube or Google anything and, and there's somebody who's been there and done that. So it's definitely made the world smaller. And, and what I guess my biggest pet peeve is, I understand that people like to post stuff. I mean, I post stuff out of necessity. It's it's just a business thing now. And I blur backgrounds and it's gotten crazy just because you have to. But uh, And so I don't begrudge anybody for posting a picture of, you know, I caught this whatever. And But why do you have to say where exactly you were? Right. And I think that's what's really done in a lot of these fisheries is I caught this at such and such a creek. You turn by the, you know, turn left at the oak tree and go down three miles and there's a great hole right there. People, you don't have to to tell the whole world. Just say, I caught this on the Northern California coast or the Sacramento yeah. Valley or whatever. Right. And try to keep the backgrounds a little more nondescript. Uh, a story on that is a friend of mine said, hey, uh, a guy that works with me, he's a part-time guide, and he's he's looking for you. He knows I know you, and he's always saying, hey, JD's posting all these salmon pictures. Where's he fishing? And my buddy said, well, I'm not going to tell you that. you know." So he said, he's looking for you. I said, well, whatever. And so one day I finally see this boat that my buddy had described and I called him. I said, yeah, your, your, your coworker found me. He goes, Oh, you know how he found you? I said, no, he goes, in one of your photos, you had a concrete picnic table in the background <laughs> and he drove from Sacramento oh, to Rio Vista on the levee road, looking for that picnic table. And I'm thinking that's see that, or that that's the bad side of it. Because if that guy had just gone fishing instead of, chasing down a fishing report i mean i think that's where we we've kind of gotten sort of sidetracked from the old days it was it was kind of cool when we had secrets mm-hmm. when you had to figure stuff out on your own because for me that's half the fun i don't mm-hmm. want to have to just just go you know look it up on youtube and go oh that's how you do that i mean it the 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 chase is the fun part but i also understand it from the standpoint of a nine to fiver you got very limited time to go fishing, yeah. and if you can expedite your learning curve, I totally get that. Yeah. I mean, that's that's where that's coming from, and and I would probably do the same thing. So I, I don't don't have any ill will towards that. It just yeah. seems like people need to use a little more discretion on their postings. 
I saw a guy who posted something on uh, one of the lakes the other day, and and the big reservoirs aren't as you know, sensitive, say, as a little trout creek or something. But you know, he said I launched at point A. We went out, you know, 300 yards, dropped the downriggers down to 22 feet. We're using this, and, and then that didn't work, so we went over here, and like you could totally track his entire day and and replicate it. And I thought. That, why not just hold up your fish and say we had a great day of trout fishing? So I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's just my – it's it's definitely changed. I, I noticed back in the days when I worked for Western Outdoor News, we did this thing called On the Spot where I would go as as the rider. You, know, you got a guide service and say, hey, Sam, fishing on the feathers been really good. Why don't you come out and do a story? And so I would go fishing for free on my off days. It wasn't free because I had to go home and write a story, but I didn't – out of pocket, you know. And then I'd write these stories about Joe Bob's guide service and how great we did. And back in the day, that was the information you had. Mm-hmm. That was the way you got your info. And these guys would call and be like, dude, I got 25 calls from that. So awesome. So I had carte blanche anywhere, you know, <laughs> like I'd call anybody up. Hey, you want a story? Heck yeah, come on down. <laughs> and and nowadays, uh, I, I hate to say it, but I don't think a whole lot of people read those, you know, the the papers anymore and i you know that was near and dear to my heart because i worked at those for so long but that's what really why we 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 picked this medium as opposed to starting like a news site or something like that you know Mm -hmm. um it's just it's more accessible to a lot more people and it it's it's consumed at a time when they actually have the time yeah in the the car car. yeah in the car when normally that's downtime not just wasted time sure no listener to always hit me up they're like yeah i'm just gonna think about fishing while i'm listening to you on my yeah. drive to work yeah. well we posted the ernie <laughs> dennison episode last week and we've had really good feedback on that one that's where like the on the water stuff so we uh-huh. we all have wireless mics and you go out and, and oh, just cool. kind of shoot the shit and um it seemed, I was talking to Nick because it's just it was surprising to us that people really dug it because we weren't sure if it was going to float or not. Yeah, no it was pun intended. Translate over. Yeah, and people just kind of like to uh, fish vicariously. It's, it 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 turns out, which is cool. You know, it's very cool. Yeah, yeah you, you get tips. You're seeing there. You're yeah. seeing, and a lot of guides are they're knowledgeable of that. You know, I'm sure they they're posting stuff and then they see all of a sudden the whole blow up next to them, you know, boats and they're like, God mm-hmm. dang it. Like I shouldn't have, yeah. shouldn't have put that picture up there yeah. so soon. You know, they're waiting a little bit longer to post Yeah, or I, they're putting, or they're putting, <laughs> you know, uh, different names. Yeah. So like on Instagram, you can name the place that you're yeah. at, you know, Joe's catching, Crab Shack. catching steelhead <laughs> in India. Yeah. You know? yep. I was in Chapman town the other day, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> yep. yeah, well, I think, you know, from the, the positive aspect of it is, um, the you know just being able to convey the lifestyle yep you know um the the positive benefits of of that lifestyle whether it be you know if you're a stressed out person it's a good way to blow off steam or you just Mm -hmm. need to get out of the house for whatever whatever reason but um you know in terms of being able to ramp up quickly on a skill set whether it be um you know watching cable shows around fly fishing or or bait fish sport fishing or if it's on youtube or if it's on instagram short videos um, the thing that I that I like about it is people are able to skill up quickly and have success. Yep. I think that you'll naturally kind of become a conservationist during that time, because at some point you'll get us you'll skill up to where that's no longer an issue. Right. And then you're going to start th- saying, "Well, why is it why is the fishing slow? I know I'm doing shit right." Yeah. And then you're like, "Okay, so it must be an environmental thing." So you kind of naturally come to this this kind of conservation spot in your life. And I think we need more of those people for so sure. That's kind of, you know, I, so I, I've, I see both sides, but I'm, I'm kind of like, Hey, I want as many people in the sport as possible, but there also needs to be some, some, uh, you know, just ethical guidelines, ethical guidelines. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and I was thinking about, it as you're saying it too, the, the other positive is all the conservation stuff that we can get out there. The like the stuff we do with the guides association where we can post, hey, here's here's yeah. a meeting. We need you guys there. Yeah. We could rally troops. We can keep people yeah. informed to the issues. And so that was a lot harder back in the the paper medium days. Yeah, and just to marshal people to get them out. Yeah, and and this is another reason why there should be more crosstalk amongst groups is as a political. You know, I keep going back to the NRA. Um, they've got a they've got some bad bad press as of late, but their power is. They've all banded together, 
you know it's not like only the shotgun guys right. talk to the shotgun guys right it's yeah you're every, a gun owner yeah, yeah. you're that's your thing yeah. you know and as from a political perspective if we want to wield some some power we do need to like join forces well, under a single kind of group that's what the norcal yeah. guides and sports yeah. association yeah. does and if you're listening you should become a member if yeah. you're if you're an avid angler no, just period you yeah know? And, and to that uh, you know people always think by joining something they're going to get caught up and you're going to get you know junk mail and you're going to get hammered to come donate to this or volunteer for that you don't have to what what signing up is 20 bucks a year and all that's all we really need from you if you want to do more that's great but what that does is when we go into these fish and game meetings we can say oh we represent xyz number of people they have to listen and, and what yeah exactly what just happened recently was we got to the point where we are, I think it's literally like seven guides short of having 50% of all licensed fishing guides in the state of California as members. Wow. And I remember as we were getting close to that number, we were in some meeting with big wigs at Fish and Wildlife, and we told them that, and they went, well, you, mm. guys, are, you guys are serious. We're going to have to start really, mm -hmm. you know, this, this, you guys yeah. are just, because there's, there's so many fishing groups that are, you know, the whatever the flycasters of yuba city yeah or, that that yeah. meet at uh caro's restaurant every right. second tuesday and, yeah. and then there's another group over here that does the same thing and they're all fragmented and yep. that's what we're trying to do is yeah bring... and, and they're they're doing stuff for their local areas Absolutely. which is great but there's there's big water management policy oh, issues that so can big. only be influenced if you've got enough people politically to marshal get them together and, and affect change there right and we're you fighting know? in that arena the the water thing i mean it's it's, it's hard to not feel like it's a foregone conclusion that we're going to lose because we're so up against such power and such money, but you can't quit. So that's why the more voices we get behind this, the more power we have. Just like you're saying, marshal as many bodies mm -hmm. as you can, because this mm -hmm. is it's going to be a knockdown drag out. And we, we need kind of like the old trench war, you know, they keep knocking us down. We need another layer of guys to come up from the mm -hmm. from the rear to to uh, keep fighting. So. It's uh, and we've done some good stuff. I'm sure when you had James Smith on, he or not James Smith, James Stone, Stone yeah. Freudian slip there, but um, he he's I'm sure fill you in all the stuff we've done. But you know, That's last, fantastic. Last year we we got two million extra salmon raised because of that spillway situation. We got the uh, jack salmon added to Central Valley regs this year. So even if we have a closure like in 2002 or 2020, which could happen. We still might be able to fish because we have jacks added. They never had jacks in the official plan, and that's what happened last year. We had the one fish Chinook limit in the valley, as you guys right. know. Yep. And we went to the commission and said, why don't you give us, you know, we're not opposed to the one fish, but why don't you give us a Chinook, adult Chinook, and one jack? And they all went, hey, oh, that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> and um, what stalled the whole thing was they couldn't come up with a way to regulate definition it, right? of what that was. Right. And so we ended up having a one fish limit when we could, because they said, yeah, the Jack numbers are, you know, whatever they're fine this year and we don't really care about them. So it's, it's, if you don't care about it, might as well let us fish on them. Uh, but because the businesses really took a hit with the one fish limit. So many of us got calls. Oh, only one fish. Eh, you know, forget it. We'll catch it mm. next year. And, and if it was a issue of, you know, I don't. I don't want two fish if it's going to wipe out the run. But if we could have that extra jack, you know, that's not harming Helps. anything. Um, so we we got that to be considered this year. We petitioned them, and it sounds like that's going to be part of their management tools going forward. So yeah, we may have a year where it's a closure of adults, but we can still fish and keep a jack. So that that or two jacks or something. So we. we Kind of keeps the whole thing going. So you talk about all these guys, like like the, you got the bass guys in one corner, the guys that swing flies in another. You know, the, all these different groups, right? I mean, they are coming together. I, you know, and they're all working together. I think, and there's still animosity between a lot of them. You know, but we got to definitely put that aside and and mm -hmm. start yeah. working together. I think there's a, a sense, a collective sense of. Oh shit, this stuff's going south on us. And we're all, you know, it's kind of like we're hitting rock bottom together. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, before this completely goes away, maybe we ought to put our little petty, oh, you know, you, you got nightcrawler dirt on your fingers and you're mm -hmm. a fluff chucker and you're this and that. Mm -hmm. Like, like, screw all that. Let's just, 
Let's, yeah, who cares? We all want the same thing, basically. And we've, with the Guides Association, we've also really partnered with the commercial salmon fishing because mm-hmm. that's always been a, a right. contentious sure. relationship. Yeah, between. so what was the what was the glue that kind of bound that together? Because that would be counterintuitive to me to think that you guys would, would dig the commercial industry or even want to work with them. But Well, we, we just, first of all, it was a matter of let's get everybody together. I mean, and the realization that we all want the same thing. If if there's enough fish that there's a commercial season, that means there's going to be enough fish for us in the river mm-hmm. and everybody's happy. So, uh, you know, if you, you get every, you know, that's a whole nother powerful lobby. So you get those mm-hmm. guys with us and we go in there shoulder to shoulder. Then, you know, the powers that be go, oh, crap, these guys are united. This, mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was, yeah, if, the, if the commercial fishery is thriving, then we're thriving too. So it really, we're all interconnected. You, you started making me think about like British Columbia. I just went there this last fall and uh, oh, yeah. was swinging for steelhead over there on off some of the Skeena and some of those tribs. And there is a huge, when you go there, it, it's like you're talking about Alaska. It's like going back in time when you're talking about fisheries. I mean, it, it's incredible what's out there. The Skeena is massive. I didn't know it was that big. It's, it's, big. it's like 10 Sacramento rivers. Yeah. Whoa. It's, it's huge. It's Probably more Whoa. than that. It's Whit, just a lot. Wide, of, like the yeah. Whip. Yeah. Holy shit. Especially down below Terrace. It gets really sick. big. A lot of water coming down. Yeah. And, and there's a big movement up there for keeping those steelhead wet. Right? Yeah. Yep. Keep them wet. I mean, don't even, don't bring them out of the water. Yeah. Keep them in the water at all times. And it, it makes sense. You you look at that resource up there and you're like, this is, yep. this is incredible. You Let's know, do they're do, doing everything they can to to do that you know and it's it, it's funny then you come back down here in california and oregon you see oregon you can still keep wild steelhead yeah. in some of these rivers you know and, <laughs> and you start thinking about that it just it's a good opportunity for again us to i think start working together and do some of these things not everybody's going to want to keep a steelhead in the water you know bring it out take a picture yeah. of it you know so let you're, it go. are you going on air, on record saying you're not going to pull a, a steelhead out of the water anymore for I, your next photo I, no i i i don't I realized when I had this kid, <laughs> when I have this baby boy, I have a baby boy, he's two months old. Very nice. I've been prepping my whole life catching these steelhead to handle this kid. <laughs> you know? Every you time I hands, grab the hands. ankles. And- Every time I land a steelhead, I, I treat it just with, uh, even if I'm going to bonk it, if it's a hatchery steelhead, I treat it like I'm going to let it go, you yep. know, all the time, every Absolutely. single time. And I think a lot of people will get lost with that in, in social media and they mm-hmm. see fish, you know, held up yep. in a gill plate or, mm-hmm. or just hold out of the water. I mean, toss back. It's, I don't know. Well, I started a huge brouhaha a couple of years ago where I, I put a post up that was basically just saying it was about stripers. And, uh, I said, instead of, you know, the guys were taking pictures of, dead fish in the box and just blood. And, and that was the only picture they were taking just carnage. to show how many they caught just carnage, yeah. which I guess is a, a valuable business tool. It generates business. But my thought was we don't need PETA and all these other guys. <laughs> yeah. There's so much, so many people attacking the sport that they see that and they think we're a bunch of Neanderthal barbarics, you know, barbarians. And, and so um, I said, why don't, you know, just, it's it's a better picture. Even if you're gonna bonk that striper or whatever it is, just hold it up. Yeah. And when it's still alive before you whack it on the head. And you know, show the smiling face. Let's put you know, let's show this industry yeah. for what it is. It's not just because I, I was just getting this feeling that people were thinking that we just we're just about killing shit, you know, and that's that's all we do. And 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 that was I felt like that was not conveying because a lot of fishermen are conservationists, and I mean, yeah. mm-hmm. and there's so much of that going on. But that was portraying a different, different, and, and you know, it's free country. Those stripers but, taste so good, oh, the little ones. You know. well, I have yet to eat a striper. Oh, fish tacos, fish tacos. <laughs> yeah. Nick always says it every time we go out. <laughs> I think that slot limit should be lowered. The uh, what, what size you think? To just below what is it? 18? Eight, oh, drop twenty two. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that uh, well, and a slot limit would be great. And I, I've this has been kind of a little dream for me, is striper slot limit because they did that in the East Coast, and their striper fishery has just gone off the charts because uh, they were killing all the big, big ones. Spawners. And, and right. what I do on my boat mm-hmm. is I generally tell people, hey, you, unless it's the spring when the striper, the male stripers, the precocious males are uh, emitting a certain fluid um <laughs> you, you can tell they're males <laughs> in the in the spring when during the spawn 
But the rest of the time, you can't really tell. It's not like a salmon where you can see a hook jaw or something. You can't tell a girl striper from a boy striper real mm-hmm. easily. So I, generally, the big ones are girls. That's just, I mean, that's that's not 100% accurate. But most of the big fish are going to be girls. And so I just say, hey, guys, you know, we fishing game is in an awkward position with these. They're not really supporting the striper fishery because they're under pressure from so many other groups. It's a non-native apex predator that is... You know, I'm not going to deny they eat salmon. They certainly do. It's not the cause of our decline. I mean, right. that's water issues because all the populations are going down. But, right. but fishing game isn't really they, – they, their hands are tied, so they can't really do anything anymore. They, we used to have striper hatcheries and stuff. I mean, they used to really – No pre- kidding. Yeah. So they used to raise stripers and do a lot more for it, but they have been sued so many times, and there's been legislation brought up to you know, by the Kern County and all those guys down in the, the water – districts to our south to eradicate stripers so fishing games really got got their you know painted into a corner on this and they mm-hmm. can't do much to promote striper populations and so it's kind of up to us if we want to have stripers going forward to do our own little sort of uh catch and release and i mean i'm not saying don't like you said eat eat some small males those things are great and they have less mercury in them anyway but yeah but you know good practice just to keep in the back of your head is just if they're over 10 pounds just consider letting it go. It's probably a female and give her a chance to spawn and don't feel bad that she's going to go eat a bunch of salmon <laughs> smolt because that's not again, the issue they, she will eat some, but you know, stripers and salmon have coexisted since the stripers were brought here in the 1850s. And we had 2002 that year I was talking about where we had almost 800,000 Chinook in the Sacramento Valley. We had good, good, good striper fishing then too. And so it was, you know, it was well, we had out. 10 years of good water too. Is that, well, is that basically the argument? Yeah, I mean, water solves solves a lot of problems in the valley. If you got yeah. enough of it, it kind of takes care of itself for the most yeah. part. And so, uh, I, I hate the demonizing of the striper. I mean, it it, right. it is a apex predator that doesn't belong here, but it's been here long enough that it's kind of a quasi native fish now. Yeah, yeah, and they're pretty damn cool to fish out though. They they especially are. when you you throw a big clouser in a little pool and three of them come up and kind of Ch- hunted in a pack yeah. it's crazy and then a 30 pounder comes so after sick. that <laughs> oh, I've, I've got so many big striper stories it's just i mean that's that's what kind of keeps you going yeah so um yeah you chase them with flies at all or yeah yeah, yeah. I, like i say i i'm, I'm by <laughs> yeah i learned a lot fishing conventional for them you know yeah. I've, I've my whole my whole life i've been conventional fly bouncing around all that learning right learning mm-hmm. as much as i can but obviously, I just learned so much throwing conventional gear. And then now I know when I'm fly fishing, okay. I'm in the zone. Okay. This makes sense. Yeah. Yep. And I've, I've done the same thing. I had some, I was doing a lot of conventional trips on the Delta, and I had two really good striper fly fishermen come out. And they didn't need my help other than just to drive a boat to take them to <laughs> where they were going. And it was funny because we throw a lot of expensive jerk baits and stuff for stripers on the spinning gear that. Yeah, you know, have these pimped Japanese paint jobs, and, and they get up to five hundred bucks. Yeah, you know, you and buy these I know it's ridiculous, but I mean these things flash and they look like a fish. You know, they really swim like a fish. And then these guys throw these. They had chartreuse and white and pink and white <laughs> clousers <laughs> that just kind of go. Ugh. I mean, they don't even. It wasn't even like marabou or something where the the just bucktail. Go yeah, up. And, and they looked stupid in the water, but they caught the crap out of them. And and I was thinking, there's something about that presentation that just it's it's it just opened my eyes to it's more than just you know the flash and the paint job. There was something or imitating the, the retrieve the and yeah. just that pulsing retrieve when you strip strip. Yeah, strip. there was something about that little steady eddy that just mm. I don't know. It was interesting. So I again, I'm I'm game to learn something from anybody. Right. So striper, I gotta take a piss. Okay. <laughs> well, before before we do that um website if somebody wanted to uh, sign up for 20 bucks because i think that's a really good idea yeah you can go to the i gotta look at it here <laughs> Nor, what is it our website <laughs> norcal guys and sportsman association it's uh ncgasa.org yep boom um, that was what about are you, you guys are on instagram yeah uh we're on facebook facebook okay are you on instagram i am Fish with JD, boom, and Facebook and Twitter talk to, and all uh, that crap. YouTube, you, you put some, you put some good stuff on there. Good videos too. Ah, thanks. You yeah, do cool. under, you've done underwater, a lot of underwater shots, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. With the underwater cam. That, 
that's something. See, here's a whole other line of questioning, so maybe we're yeah. not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you use for your underwater stuff, and why did you decide to do underwater? Um, well, I decided to do it because it's freaking cool. Yeah. cool yeah. You it, spend your whole life cool. looking at it from a certain perspective. You're yeah. like, let's see it from right. the real perspective. Well, and there's, there's so much to learn by seeing it at a different angle mm -hmm. and underwater. But uh, in Alaska, it's a great opportunity. That's where I do a lot of it because there's so many fish. You're right, yeah, it makes mm -hmm. it easy. And they're not particularly shy. and Because and, a lot of times I'm running the camera – six to 12 inches ahead of the whatever it is i'm using so there's a big camera right in their face and i'm using a uh, i used a water wolf camera for a while now i've got a go fish it looks like a it looks like a torpedo right yeah like a cigar yeah it's a run off of a line or something yeah it's got oh, a okay. it's got a wire eyelet on either end just like a lure so you tie one in to your main line and the other to your leader and then you just you know i, I run it close to the the camera so you can see you know if you if you get too much line out then sometimes the hook or whatever you're using isn't in the shot it's a pretty wide angle lens mm. but still the, closer the turbidity you, of the water even if it looks cool. clear is can be yeah tough yeah yeah and, and i did one i don't know if you saw it trolling spinners for salmon and, and uh it was amazing it was in alaska and i remember the day our whole group of lodge boats was fishing this one hole in tidewater and Every boat would go down and you pff, double header, you know, next guy, double header, double. I mean, just all day long. And so I have some video of how many fish the lure actually goes by and how many reject it or follow it and peel off. I remember seeing that. And, and it was a lot. Yeah. And, and, and to think that we were just smoking them, how many fish were in there, you know, if, <laughs> if that many rejected it, it was crazy. So it's, I don't know. It's just really fun. I, that's one of the things I do. I don't really go fishing much when I'm up there. By the time you're done working at six o'clock at night, you're kind of like, yeah, I'll have some dinner and then you have a little food in your belly. And it's like, uh, I think I'm going nighty night now, <laughs> but, uh, uh, which is crazy. Cause you're in paradise. It's, <laughs> right. Fish, fish till 1130 at night. Yeah. I'm going to, um, Prince of Wales. <laughs> oh, nice. Island. Like, uh, pretty soon. In, Steelhead think, fishing. Yeah. Yeah. Very in, cool. in May or June. Nice. Um, are there going to be grizzly bears on those small islands? <laughs> not on Prince of Wales. Plenty of black bears, though. Okay. Lots of black bears. But they're not as They're worse aggressive. than the grizzlies. I don't, don't, dude, don't say that. <laughs> they kind of are. They, they say that you can fight off a grizzly bear and scare off a grizzly bear. A black bear, if it wants to get you, mm -hmm. it's not going to stop. It's going to keep going. They can be pretty pissy. Fantastic. We, we deal mostly with grizzlies up where I am. And... Yeah, generally speaking, right. they want about as much to do yeah, with you as them. Exactly. They're there get, to eat, right? They're just looking for salmon. Yeah, and, and where you get into trouble with any kind of bear is if you startle babies. them and babies or startle a mom with babies. That's yeah. a double whammy. So, you know, when you're tromping around up there, just make noise. I used to wear a bell. You know, you can get those bear bells that go on your pack or whatever. And you just, hey, bear, hey, bear, hey, bear. Just let, you know, you don't. You don't want to come up on them and, and surprise them. And, and the interesting thing about shoulder bears, tap them. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? But bears don't see or hear very well. And so that's kind of the scary part that mm. like you can kind of stumble on. They smell very well. I mean, they've got a real good mm. olfactory, but their, their vision. And so if you're walking into the wind. Yeah. It just be, <laughs> make some noise. That, yeah. That's the biggest thing. Try, try to avoid the heavy overgrowth, you know, tromping through stuff where you can't see. Did you have any scary incidents with your clients up there and involving a gun or anything like that? Or um, no, we've we've yeah. had some bears that cruise around and and get a little little close, but uh, I've never been <laughs> right on wood charged yeah. by yeah. by by a bear yet. Um, though <laughs> it's kind of related. I, we went up one of those like we were talking about little creeks that it, I mean it was experts only. You got to know what you're doing driving up this thing, and I would take these guys way up like an hour up this thing to go trout fishing after they'd caught salmon for several days. Like, Hey, let's go catch some trout on fly rod in this little Creek and jumping stumps and sliding corners. And you know, most of it's three inches deep or whatever. And we, we got way up there. I didn't have to go an hour. I just like the drive. So, you know, kill some time, take a nice boat ride. And so we go way up there. We get out of the boat. I'm tying it off. And this Creek's so small that you're not fishing from the boat. You, you get out and I'd always tie the boat facing downhill back towards home in case Mr. Grizz came along. We could hopefully get everybody in and get the hell out of there. <laughs> well, I hear this. And then all of a sudden, 
my face is on fire. The guy pepper sprays me oh, shit. because he was scared of bears and he was testing it. And and so oh, shit. And, and he, he did it upwind to me, but it, we're in like a 14 or whatever. That was 16 foot John boat. So it's not too far away. Upwind, he just did a little. It wasn't like a full frontal blast yeah. or anything. And it brought me to my knees. Oh, yeah. I was like, holy crap. It's not crap. fun. And so, like, what are you doing? You're blinding the driver. How do, how do we get out of here if you blind the driver, you knucklehead? So I threw his pepper spray in the trees. <laughs> but uh, that was that was one. And then coming down that creek and all those little creeks, I always figured, well, as long as, you know, if a bear, as long as he didn't surprise you and just come out charging and you don't have time to get everybody in the boat. If you see one coming, like, okay, guys, let's get in the boat. Everybody be cool. Then we'll just, meow. And I always felt like that was our safety pod, you know, our escape pod. And and the one thing that did concern me was a bear could cut the corner, you know, if you want, because these things are real windy. And but I always thought, get in that boat, and as long as he's not smart enough to cut the corner, you're out of there, you know. <laughs> and uh, and so one time, you know, coming around these blind corners, sliding, and you know, you're in six inches of water or whatever, so you can't stop. And I was always scared that someday I'd come around a corner, there'd just be a big head, like big, yeah, a bunch of brown. Yeah, you just front. run into right. one. Yeah, because they're literally they're there to eat. Yeah, and I came around this corner, and every hair on my body stood up because the first thing I catch is just a giant brown thing. Well, it's a cow moose, which isn't a picnic either. They actually those are more dangerous yeah, than the bears. Yeah, yeah. but less less uh, toothy, I guess. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I come around this corner, and at first, my initial thought is, "Oh, there he is, grizzly bear." And, and what do you do? You can't come off step. You know, you're in a foot of water or less and, and you can't go through them. So that was, that's always been my big scare up there. If one's playing center field in the middle of the creek, right. you're screwed. So I came around and so the initial thought was, oh, bear. And then I'm like, okay, moose. All right. That's a little better. And she, she spooked. So she took off uh, with her calf and she's running upstream. And so, or I guess it was downstream actually. So we, we chasing her cause she's running parallel to the creek. And the, one of the clients has a video camera. He's like, dude, Speed up! I want to, you know, videotape this thing. And I realized I was wide open, and this moose is pulling away. Oh, jeez! I was like, okay, I'm slower than the moose. Moose is slower than the. Oh shit, the bear! <laughs> <laughs> and that's when my whole bubble just went. Oh, what am I doing out here? <laughs> wow! So that's, that's they can all flat out move at 35 miles an hour, and your boat's well, the, only skipping 20. Yeah, the there. first time I'm just thinking the first time you go up one of those those rivers in your your jet boat, you've never been up it, and you're going around a blind turn. That's got to be that's oh. got to be an ass puckering. It is a little bit. It is it makes you live though. It makes you feel alive. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Especially when you get back. You can exhale, <laughs> Jesus. But it's it's fun. I mean, that jet boat in those back country. I mean, uh, if you had a camera on me, it's just like ear to ear grin the whole time. Oh, it's just so cool. Yeah. And the, those Sounds things are awesome. so full of fish too. That's the other part that you go up these little creeks and just loaded with trout and dollies and all five species of salmon and so some cool. of them have grayling and pike and it's like oh man, so cool. Then you come home to the central valley in august and go huh well i guess i'll go fishing now we got a good thing here it's just it's not, definitely not alaska that's well sure. yeah and that yeah. that's just yeah. the, it's the transition it's a, not right. a fair it's not a fair it's not it's not at all comparison well let's uh let's have you back on but maybe next time we'll do a on the water episode yeah let's do it and i hate to cut this conversation short because it's gotta, been fun but i gotta go to the bathroom go. Me too. Oh, yeah. oh yeah you said that like 20 minutes ago i forgot okay cool uh, well thanks for listening if you guys like this episode please rate us on Insta- instagram jesus on iTunes or Google Play Store. We're on Instagram at barbless.co. You can follow Nick at NorCal Fly Guy. You can follow me at Child Alderson. Your Instagram one more time? Fish with JD. Boom. Follow, follow. Leave leave uh, comments. Let us know how you like this episode. Thanks for listening. Fish on. This podcast would not be possible without support from our sponsors, Fish Bio and Amped Up Bill. FishBio is a consulting firm that offers a fresh approach to fishery science. They specialize in fish research, monitoring, and conservation with innovative uses of technology and communication. From their offices in Chico, Oakdale, and Santa Cruz, California, to Vien Chen Laos, FishBio is committed to solving natural resource challenges locally and globally. Learn more at www.fishbio.com.
and Amp.Bill. Amp is a software design and engineering shop located in Chico, California. Amp creates beautiful apps for mobile and desktop devices, wearables, and the Internet of Things. Amp develops native, web, and hybrid apps on a variety of platforms. Chad, who co-hosts this podcast, is the agency's founder. Learn more at www.amp.bill.